गुड इवनिंग ऑल वेलकम टू आई फोकस ऑनलाइन द थ्री फिफ्टी फोर्थ एपिसोड ट्वेंटी नाइन्थ इन द ऑक्यूलोप्लास्टी मॉड्यूल वी आर हैविंग अ प्लेजर टू हैव डॉक्टर संतोष जी होनावर फ्रॉम सेंटरफोसाइड हैदराबाद टू स्पीक टू अस ऑन ई विसरेशन कॉन्ट्रैक्टेड सॉकेट इटियोलॉजी क्लासिफिकेशन एंड मैनेजमेंट टूडे ओवर टू यू सर थैंक यू i couldn't uh, complete evisceration last time so i'll start with evisceration today and then go on to contracted socket evisceration was uh, first performed officially by james peer in 1817 so how do you know for what, which case did he perform what was the indication before that of course in stone age animals would perform evisceration but then this was the first official recorded case of evisceration what do you think was the indication He was a cataract surgeon. He was not an oculoplasty surgeon. So why did he have to perform evisceration, and why was it documented? So what complication would he have had in cataract surgery that prompted him to do evisceration? And doctor, my thing, expulsive hemorrhage. Absolutely right. So you did Google search very quickly, Tuju. So that was <laughs> okay. That was actually expulsive hemorrhage for which he, which he had to do evisceration. and that that was documented so the process of evisceration has been tagged to his name and that was just 160 216 years ago so if you had done it then they probably would have an unut cuts procedure or something of that sort right so you're born a little late so <laughs> the definition is that it's complete removal of intraocular content with preservation of sclera so it means that cornea with may or may not be removed it's not mandatory that you should remove cornea but most of the sclera would be preserved not all of sclera for example if there is staphyloma then you would trim certain amount of sclera and not leave all of it so most of the sclera would be preserved and if most of the sclera is excised then it's a variant of evisceration or variant of enucleation you can call it is called filaxation right so that is the definition now these are the indications normal sized blind eye for whatever reason if you are doing it for cosmosis or for pain symptomatic patient enlarged blind eye such as staphyloma endophthalmitis is an indication panophthalmitis is a controversial indication some say that it should be done some say that it should not be done there are arguments to both one of the arguments to not to do evisceration in panophthalmitis is that infection may be transmitted through the optic nerve to the meninges the reason why it is done in panophthalmitis is that uh, you know it's a quick procedure and does not involve much bleeding and if it is not done so for example if indurated sclera is left it will take a long time to collapse and if there is infiltration of the sclera if it is fungal endophthalmitis or panophthalmitis of fungal etiology then in that situation you would be leaving residual infection behind so those are arguments for and against but in a given clinical situation the clinician takes a decision expulsive hemorrhage is one such indication for which evisceration is performed but it is not ideal for atrophic or thysical eyes mainly because the purpose of evisceration is not just to provide symptomatic relief it is also to provide cosmosis and the goal of placing an optimal sized implant and replacing volume is not adequately met in atrophic or thysical eyes unless you do relaxing incisions or place the implant retroscleralically so unless you do these modifications you will not be able to do this procedure in atrophic eyes and definitely in thysical eyes you will be not be convinced about removal of uvea completely there might be some uveal remnants because thysical eyes are supposed to be degenerated eyes with lot of adhesions within these eyes and you we are may not be completely removed so these are the contraindications the reasons are obvious prior vitreoretinal surgeries if at all there has been cryo performed or laser performed or prior surgeries vitreoretinal surgeries have performed there would be uh, adhesion between the sclera and the choroid and that is the reason why uveal evacuation will not be complete in patients who have undergone prior vr surgeries 
and it is understandable that certain prior vr surgeries may be performed in situations where there could be a occult tumor right if there is a cataract surgery performed and there is a complication it's unlikely that there is an occult tumor but if there is a vr surgery that has been performed and it has failed repeatedly there are possibilities of occult tumor and exactly in those situations when vr surgery has been performed and the patient has been eviscerated you would find that there is a hidden melanoma which is lurking somewhere so that is one of the reasons why prior vr surgeries you should take it very seriously one more important consideration in prior vr surgeries is that if it's a silicon filled eye then your imaging even b scan will be suboptimal you know that in silicon filled eyes b scan is going to give you wrong information or no information at all and if it's a hidden melanoma you'll not be able to detect it and also in vr surgeries if a necrotic melanoma is evacuated thinking that it is hemorrhage it can look very very similar then you will not find evidence of a dome shaped tumor or a mushroom shaped tumor within the eye on imaging and that may give you a false sense of security in going ahead with the evisceration and on histopathology you might find residual so in this i would consider as a top contraindication prior vr surgeries for evisceration so you should be very careful if you really want to do it you should be very careful i know why my pen is not working there really. yeah the color is wrong yeah prior vr surgeries you should be very careful severe trauma the only reason being that you your uvl clearance may be incomplete if it's ruptured sclera and somebody has sutured the sclera already there will be uvl incarceration and the patient is already predisposed to sympathetic ophthalmia then on top of that if you do evisceration and leave uvl tissue behind that may be counterproductive thysis or atrophy of unknown etiology this should be viewed with lot of concern especially in two extremes of age group one is children the second is elderly in the mid age that is okay but children younger than 6 years of age elderly 70 plus or 60 plus you should view thysis or atrophy of unknown etiology where etiology cannot be discerned at all on clinical evaluation where you cannot see the fundus very seriously that's because many of them have a tumors especially in children extensive calcification sometimes you find that the eye is filled with calcium and you'll not be able to know why, what is the reason for such a calcification and it is impossible to evacuate that calcification with the uh, corneal excision that you have done so open sky this calcification is so broad that you will not be able to excise it within this window that you have created you will have to do sclerotomy etc and this extensive calcification may be because of a pre existing retinoblastoma so you try to avoid evisceration these are not absolute contraindications but these are reasons for caution enough to avoid in evisceration if that is possible for example looking at this child two year old child would you be able to say what is thysis due to just looking at it it's a white thysical eye with yellowish reflex right looks like there is some anterior chamber x rays also which is organized it could just be endophthalmitis endo endogenous endogenous endophthalmitis is possible in children it could be anything it could be an occult trauma we really don't know right in such a situation when you do imaging if this if this is a thysical eye when you do atrophic eye when you do imaging if there is calcification in the center of the eye then that is more indicative of retinoblastoma or calcification in the anterior part of the eye somewhere here is indicative of medulloepithelioma whereas if there is calcification of the coats sclerocoroidal calcification like concentric to the sclera then that is likely to be dystrophic calcification in thysical eye so there are ways to differentiate intraocular calcification the etiology of which nevertheless in a thysical eye in a child my strong advice would be to avoid enucleation even if you are pretty sure that it is not retinoblastoma so this kind of calcification is something that you would worry about calcification within the eye whereas calcification in the sclera choroid would be dystrophic that's how you on imaging differentiate one from the other so what are the requirements of evisceration clinically or imaging is mandatory if you do evisceration without imaging then you are to blame yourself imaging would not just include ultrasound b scan but b scan with immersion because you will need to rule out anterior tumors as well 
an anteriorly situated retinoblastoma in an older child. Medullary epithelioma, in fact, more than half of medullary epitheliomas are diagnosed after some form of surgery on the child. These are occult tumors that are hidden in the ciliary body and you may not be able to look at it unless you do an immersion B scan. And if required, a UBM in a form dye, UBM is possible, not so much in an atrophic eye and that should be attempted if possible. If you're still not able to know what is the reason, then you should do a CT scan or a MRI or appropriate. And finally, after having done evisceration, you should never throw the specimen and histopathology is mandatory because if you throw the specimen without subjecting it to histopathology, then it is possible that you might be missing an occult tumor. The incidence of occult tumor is not so much literate, uh, reported in the literature because of the fear of legal issues. But it is, believe me, it is quite common. It is not uncommon at all to find, at least if somebody is doing evisceration regularly, once in a few months, he or she would have encountered a tumor which has been kind of occult and not diagnosed on clinical radiological evaluation. So these are the steps that you would take. Now, in evisceration, it is considered that implant size is a limitation. Do you agree with this statement? Is that really a limitation? If it was clerotomy, so we can uh, ideally place an implant of our choice. The Right, but I don't think implant size is so much of a limitation because here the implant is placed anteriorly within the scleral cavity and optic nerve is right there, right? Whereas in enucleation, when you place the implant, if this is the orbit, in enucleation, when you place the implant, implant is placed here in the intraconal space. Correct? Yes. So, yeah. So, you need a larger implant in enucleation and you'll need a relatively smaller implant in, in evisceration because your placement of implant is in a different plane altogether. So, implant size is not a limitation in a fully formed eye or a staphylomatous eye but it is a limitation in a atrophic eye or a smaller eye. That is the consideration. Now, what is the size of the implant that you can theoretically place in a 24 millimeter axial length normal sized eye in which you have done evisceration? How do you calculate that? Quickly. What is the axial length? My, my see, simple, right? Circumference of the eye with 24 millimeter axial length taking pi as 3 is 72 millimeter. Oh. Yeah, out of which you remove 12 millimeter of the cornea, just rounding it up. So you are left with 60 millimeter, right? And divide 60 by 3 is 20. 20. But then what you're also doing is that you are creating a circular circular wound and you're suturing it vertically. That's kind of a okay. suturing like a baseball. You're converting a sphere into a ellipse. Correct? Okay. So you lose at least three to four millimeters of sclera in that process because there will be winging of the sclera on either side. So your actual implant size would be somewhere between 16 to 18 millimeter, depending on how much of winging occurs. Correct? So theoretically, you can put an implant of 20 millimeter, but you need edge of sclera to suture. So there, one millimeter or two millimeter is minus. So you come to 18 millimeter. But when you have to make that sphere or, or the circle of corneal excision into a horizontal wound, you lose these wings. And there is also vertical shortening of the eye. And that, that will result in a loss of 2, two millimeters or 3 millimeters. So theoretically, although you can place a 20 millimeter implant, practically you can place about 16 millimeter of implant for sure with adequate scleral suturing. There, would, there should be no tension over the scleral wound. All right. So that is how you should never try to place an 18 millimeter implant in an eviscerated sclera unless you have done sclerotomy or you have a staphylomatous eye. So the process is very simple. This video shows it. The first step is, of course, peritomy, as close to the limbus as possible. We want all the conjunctiva to be preserved. 
this can be done uh, under local anesthesia or general anesthesia it is your choice really does not matter local anesthesia is very comfortable to patients if you are given a good block 360 degree peritomy preserving the conjunctiva with a blunt tip scissors as close to the limbus as possible then you do tenens dissection in oblique meridia then you excise the deceased cornea this is a staphylomatosis sclera is thin so you might want to excise little more sclera than what is necessary for all its excess so once corneal button is excised you have to use a evisceration spoon or scoop and then clear the uveal contents you can see that uveal tissue is adherent to the cornea obviously there was anterior synechia uveal tissue is very carefully separated from the sclera and it should be evacuated as a single bolus it should not be broken down into fragments you can use plain forceps once you are separated and evacuate it as a bolus but despite which there will be some remnants of uveal tissue in the sclera that needs to be removed by scraping it and finally you have to apply absolute alcohol to the in inner surface of the sclera to denature this uveal tissue and reduce the risk of sympathetic ophthalmia if you have applied alcohol twice over obviously you have to wash it out and then put the implant once you put the adequate size implant if you think sclera is more than what is required you don't want a flappy sclera around the implant so you can trim it it's your choice you can leave it as well it really does not matter so much then you suture it you take reliable bites on either sides you should not be too close to the edge sclera being a collagen rich tissue heals by secondary intention so you should not use a catgut suture because catgut suture will dissolve in 5 to 7 days you should use vicryl which will stay for longer not advisable to use non absorbable sutures because they will poke through the conjunctiva and they may cause infection granuloma formation etc so you need a absorbable suture but a suture that would stay for a longer time than catgut so you can see that now circle is become a has become a line so obviously when a circle is converted into a line or a straight line wound configuration is modified there is winging of sclera on either side now that wing should not be allowed to stand up but it needs to be buried so you take the apex of the wing and turn it towards the side where it is naturally curving and suture it you can see this that's the apex of the wing and then i turn it to the side where it is naturally curving and suture it back to the sclera then finally if you find good tenens it's a good idea to suture tenens on top of the sclera and finally conjunctiva conjunctival suturing will be key pattern suture just like in you do in enucleation continuous key pattern suture to make sure that the conjunctival edges remain well opposed and inverted not inverted so that you avoid conjunctival retention cyst formation so that's again a vicryl suture that we use for conjunctiva so that's a simple step of evisceration at the end of it it is mandatory again to leave a conformer that's to lock the conjunctival continuous suture mandatory to leave a conformer which is about 24 26 mm is a age appropriate size which is snugly fitting but not too tight to disrupt the wound and also do a suture tarsography that's the end of evisceration now there are uh, various modifications of evisceration one of which is sclerotomy now sclerotomy could be radial or circumferential radial sclerotomy would mean if this is the sclera if it is radial radial to the limbus then that is called radial sclerotomy radial sclerotomy is generally done in oblique meridia between the recti right not along the rectus but between say for example in between superior rectus and the medial rectus medial rectus and the inferior rectus so it is always done in oblique meridia so that there is equatorial expansion of the sclera to accommodate a larger implant right circumferential sclerotomy is done in the at the equator so or towards the optic nerve it can be done 
circumferential sclerotomy if this is the eye circumferential sclerotomy is either done at the equator or towards the posterior pole so that the scleral cavity is separated into anterior half and the posterior part between which you accommodate the implant so the gap between the anterior part of the sclera and the posterior part of the sclera is nothing obviously there is no tissue there and the naked implant will be visible in that area even when you do radial sclerotomy part of the implant will be exposed to the orbital soft tissues so that is the problem with sclerotomies is that the implant is not completely covered by sclera then the next option is when you do these procedures you can either keep the optic nerve or remove the optic nerve if you remove the optic nerve then you can prolapse the implant into the intraconal space partly or completely in a thysic ally if you remove the optic nerve and create a posterior vent in the sclera you can completely prolapse the implant in the intraconal space it's like doing enucleation but without disturbing the extraocular muscles and providing a double layered scleral support to the implant because you have two layers of the sclera on top of the implant because sclera is completely collapsed for example you have done evisceration then optic nerve there is a disc of sclera that is removed and radial sclerotomy is already performed so implant that you have put prolapses into the intraconal space partly or completely on top of that you have this layer of sclera and this layer of sclera you have two layers of sclera on top of that right so it's a secure closure so this is just like doing enucleation it does not provide any additional benefit except that psychologically you have reassured the patient that we have not removed the complete eye that's that's one of the considerations some patients have that the complete eye should not be removed and you have not disturbed the extraocular muscles so implant motility will be slightly better now hemisection four petal technique are just the variants partly partial or complete exteriorization is exactly what i meant exteriorization of the implant towards the orbital apex partly in the sense that part of the implant will be within the scleral cavity and part of which will be outside the scleral cavity in the intraconal space complete is when you completely prolapse the implant into the intraconal space through the posterior scleral window that you have created this is a very nice technique described by selesans where he created four petals of sclera each one of which with an extraocular muscles it's a simple process where you know after having done evisceration you have to make oblique incisions right through the rim so oblique incision right through the rim foil this is the these are the recti medial rectal superior and inferior you make four incisions and make four petals so the four petals will be hanging on to the optic nerve that is the point of contact of the four petals now when you have done that how will you place the implant you have made the four petals if you place the implant within the four petals how will you close the sclera you cannot close the sclera so this process is necessarily associated with a disc of sclera around the optic nerve to be finally removed once you have done that these four petals will become separated posteriorly with a wide gape so you push the implant posteriorly through this gape that is created so part of the implant is now exteriorized part of the implant lies within the scleral cup then you suture these four petals so the petal that is associated with the medial rectus is sutured to the petal that is associated with the lateral rectus and superior rectus with the inferior rectus so there is a double layered closure like this one layer horizontally and one layer vertically providing secure closure to the implant and the muscles are not disturbed at all oblique also will be inserted at some point so muscles are never disturbed so implant motility is better and implant exposure or extrusion is much less because you have provided the implant with double layered closure posterior tenons of course will be missing in this situation because we are not explored for the posterior tenons but all that you need to close now after this is anterior tenons and conjunctiva so instead of posterior tenons you are given double layered scleral protection which is a very good procedure if you are considering evisceration and if you have a small sized eye and if you cannot put an implant of 16 mm or so then it's an ideal process where you would create four petals and partly exteriorize the implant so this is a relatively new procedure this has a sound if you don't hear the sound just let me know
Evisceration is a surgical technique by which all the intraocular contents are removed while preserving the remaining scleral shell, extraocular muscle attachments and surrounding. Evisceration is a surgical technique by which all the intraocular contents are removed while preserving the remaining scleral shell, extraocular muscle attachments and surrounding orbital adnexa, followed usually by the placement of an orbital implant to replace the lost ocular volume. Various indications for evisceration are thysis bulbi, atrophic bulbi, anterior staphyloma, panophthalmitis, microphthalmos, and painful blind eye. Malignancy is an absolute contraindication to evisceration. It is imperative that an intraocular malignancy must be ruled out either by fundus examination or imaging before recommending. Evisceration is an evolving surgery which was introduced in 1817 by Beer in expulsive hemorrhage case. In 1874, Noyes introduced this process in intraocular infection case. In 1884, Muse further enhanced the cosmetic result after evisceration by placing a hollow glass sphere within the residual sclera to add the volume and support. Now the question comes, how to calculate the implant size? The first step is to measure the axial length of the contralateral normal line. Let us take it for example as 24mm. Second step is to calculate the circumference by formula pi d, assuming that the pi is simply 3. So for example, for 24mm axial length, the circumference would be 24 into 3, that is 72mm. In the third step, subtract the diameter of the cornea and limbal tissue that are removed in the evisceration from the circumference. Example, assuming cornea to be 11mm and removing 1mm of the limbus. So we subtract 12mm from the circumference. So we are now left with 60mm of the available circumference. In the fourth step, we divide it by pi or 3. So we end up with a possible implant size of 20 mm. But for the final implant size, we subtract again it by 2 mm. Why? To allow 1 mm of sclera on either side for suturing, as we don't want a tight suture. So the final implant size for 24 mm axial length is 18 mm. Now the problem is, suppose if the maximum possible implant is not sufficient enough to restore the volume and most likely to leave enough thalamus even after the surgery, then this won't work. So there are various methods to modify the surgical technique to allow for a larger orbital implant placement. And hence came the era of sclerotomies. Basic principle of any sclerotomy is either a radial or a equatorial incision with or without optic nerve disinsertion. Different patterns of sclerotomies from the beginning era are it all began in 1987 when Stephenson performed multiple radial expansion sclerotomies as well as posterior spiral sclerotomy. In 1997, Zordon and Anderson described disinsertion of the optic nerve and performed small radial sclerotomies. In the same year, Yang et al. described scleral quadrisection technique. In this technique, the native sclera is quadrisected from the limbus to the optic nerve between the rectus muscle insertions with the optic nerve intact. In 2000, Long et al. reported the transscleral evisceration technique in which the posterior sclera is opened and an untrapped orbital implant is placed behind it in the intraconal orbital fat. In 2001, Masri and Hole described obliquely splitting the scleral cavity into two quadrants, superotemporally and inferonasally, releasing the flaps from their optic nerve head attachments. In 2007, Sales Sands and Sands Lopez described four petal technique. Four sclerotomies were performed from the limbus between the rectus muscle insertion to the optic nerve. The optic nerve is cut at its insertion point in the posterior sclera. This technique divides the sclera into four petals, each with one of the four rectus muscles. This will allow the placement of implant entirely in the intraconal space over which the scleral flaps are sutured. In 2010, George popularized equatorial sclerotomy technique. In this video, we demonstrate evisceration in a 39-year-old male with a painful blind eye following trauma. We use the novel circumferential complete equatorial relaxing incision technique to allow for a larger implant with anterior placement and thus preservation of the orbital volume. Step 1. Peritomy. 
care is taken to preserve as much as conjunctiva possible. In our case, the conjunctiva is adherent temporally, so peri peritomy is done last and carefully in those areas. Dissection of the conjunctiva is very crucial to retain the optimal ocular surface and phonational depth. The scissors is held almost parallel to the conjunctiva to get as close to the limbus as possible and a non-tooth forceps is used to prevent the conjunctival damage. Step 2. Removal of the corneal button. A full thickness limbal incision is made with 11 number scalpel and the remainder of the limbus is cut with the scissors allowing for the removal of the corneal button. Step 3. Removal of the intraocular contents. Create a small crevice between the rim of the sclera and ciliary body and then using evisceration scoop, gently separate the sclera from ciliary body 360 degree. In one careful posterior sweep, rest of the uveal tissue is separated from the sclera and removed end block. Step 4. Clean the residual. Carefully inspect the inside of the sclera and remove the bits of the residual uveal tissue. Uvea may be densely adherent to the sclera in the areas of the polyretinal scar, at the sites of perforating nerves and vessels and around the optic disc. Step 5. Alcohol Denaturation The inner surface of the sclera is then scrubbed twice with the absolute alcohol on the cotton tip applicator. This process will remove adherent uveal tissue or denature what cannot be removed and thus minimize the theoretical risk of sympathetic ophthalmia. While doing it, we avoid spillage of alcohol to contaminate the conjunctiva. Step 6. Removal of the Residual Alcohol the scleral cup is irrigated with 20 cc of ringer lactate to wash out alcohol residual, carefully avoiding the conjunctival spillage. Step 7. Hemostasis The inner surface of the sclera is inspected for persistent bleeding points which are gently cauterized. Step 8. Sclerotomy and implant placement Small anterior sclerotomy at the rim is performed to allow the injury of the implant. The optimal implant size in this patient was 16 mm. However, even a 15 mm implant was tight, so we proceeded with a complete equatorial relaxing incision. While making this incision, we cut by lifting up the sclera to minimize the damage to extraocular muscles and we avoid vortex veins in order to minimize the bleeding. We completed the incision to divide the sclera into two halves. Now we were able to place a larger silicon implant and it fits easily. Step 9. Closure Scleral trim is sutured with closely placed 6 0 vehicle interrupted sutures. Winging at the edges is turned onto the surface in its natural direction and sutured. Conjunctiva is sutured with continuous key pattern sutures with a 6 0 vehicle. A snugly fitting and well centered confirmer is placed and suture tarsorophy is performed and left for a week. The implant motility is optimal at 6 weeks and the custom ocular prosthesis matches with. Okay, so that was the process of equatorial relaxing incision, which I feel is slightly better than for petal technique because it does not exteriorize the implant implant is within the two layers of the sclera and it is it generally can accommodate a 18 19 or even a 20 millimeter implant so the advantages of evisceration are that it is a faster procedure no doubt compared to enucleation it is psychologically acceptable in a set of patients who do want at least uh, to be explained that their complete eye is not removed and uh, uh, part of the eye is retained less bleeding obviously it there is a quicker recovery. There is no disturbance of orbital anatomy, especially the anatomy of the extraocular muscles. There is almost no risk of implant migration, extrusion or extrusion unlike enucleation and better implant motility for sure, most of which can be transmitted to the prosthesis. But pegging is not possible in evisceration because you cannot ideally use an integrated implant in enucleation. You have to use a non-integrated or a silicone or a PMMA implant.
the disadvantages is that there could be a hidden malignancy which has often been uh, not been reported but it is not too uncommon to find a hidden malignancy especially in patients who have undergone multiple prior vitroretinal procedures or glaucoma procedures lot loss of intact sample for histopathology unless you take care like you saw in the video we could remove the ul tissue as a bolus and if that is done then you have the entire sample preserved for histopathology otherwise there would be a lot of blood clot and some kind of fragmented uveal tissue that may be sent to the pathologist and the pathologist may not be able to examine all of that and create a block and you know have red loafing of all of that and the tumor can still be missed there's a theoretical risk of sympathetic ophthalmia with evisceration so these are some of the disadvantages so i'll go to uh, contracted socket i think we have already 35 minutes i don't know how we are going to complete Let's see. Okay, so what is the definition of contracted socket while I share the screen to you can tell us? How do you define a contracted socket? Sir, uh, it can be created uh, as per the... One single sentence is that socket where a reasonably okay. sized prosthesis cannot be placed or retained is defined functional definition of a contracted socket. You don't measure a socket and then say it is contracted. There are no uh, measurement definitions, but this is a simple functional def definition where a reasonably sized prosthesis cannot be placed or cannot be retained. Now, there are classifications congenital or acquired, anophthalmic and ophthalmic. It is understandable that congenital, anophthalmic and acquired anophthalmic are realities. But what about congenital, ophthalmic and acquired ophthalmic contracted socket? What does that mean? Microphthalmus. Right. So, congenital, ophthalmic contracted socket would mean there is severe microphthalmus because of which there is contracted socket. Acquired ophthalmic would mean? Ankle injury. Possibly soft tissue injury or a bony pathology resulting in contracted bony orbital cavity. So contracted socket can again be classified as bony contracture. Bony contracture could be congenital in the situation of a microphthalmus or clinical anophthalmus. Soft tissue contracture, which is generally for fall which generally follows enucleation or evisceration or trauma combined bone and soft tissue contracture which can again be because of congenital anophthalmus and uh, clinical congenital microphthalmus and uh, clinical anophthalmus and uh, even in trauma so this is an example of a soft tissue and bony contracture you can see that the right orbit is quite large as compared to the left orbit this was a child who has undergone enucleation as an infant. Now, the implant size possibly that was placed was about 13 or 14 millimeter. That's what it looks like. And the orbit has not expanded at all. That is the prosthesis that has been shown on the CT scan. You can see that there is gross in ophthalmus, right? So that's mainly because the implant size has been suboptimal. You can actually do measurement of the soft orbital volume on CT scan using image software. And you find here that there is about 12 millimeter, 12 cc of volume deficit in the left orbit. So there's a clear cut situation where there is a bony contracture because of a smaller implant. So bony contracture can also happen because of developmental issues in a situation where there is congenital anophthalmus, anophthalmus or microphthalmus, and also in situations where you have failed to place an adequately sized implant to stimulate the growth of the orbit. So classification, there is there are many classifications. Mild, moderate, severe is one classification. There are also numerical grading systems. The most popular in India, at least, is Gopal Krishna classification, where grade zero would mean deep phonesis. There is no contracted socket. Would essentially mean that an adequately sized prosthesis can be inserted and retained. Grade 1 is shallowing of the lower phonics. Lower phonics is the most crucial phonics for the prosthesis. It is the weight-bearing phonics unless you have pegged it. And shallowing is when the lower phonics is 
shorter in depth shelving is when the lower lid is everted like you see the lower lid eversion that is called shelving shallowing and shelving are two different terms both of which can be used but generally there is shallowing of the lower fornix which is also associated with shelving of the lower eyelid so this is grade 1 contracted socket grade 2 is when both the upper fornix and the lower fornix are involved and it's sometimes difficult clinically to know if both the fornices are involved or not a simple test would be remove the prosthesis or the conformer that the patient is using anesthetize the ocular surface use a blunt tip cot uh, spatula or a cotton tip applicator and push the lower fornix down ideally use a spatula with about 12 mm mark there that means that is the depth of the lower fornix and that the mark has to align with the lower lid margin so you have pushed the lower fornix to about 12 mm depth by aligning the mark on the spatula to the lower lid margin when you do that you should observe what is happening to the upper fornix if nothing happens to the upper fornix then it is just the lower fornicial contraction but when you push this if the upper fornix shallows that means that by this process the upper fornix shallowing is hidden right so once you push the lower fornix down to its normal position the upper fornix and the process upper fornix starts coming down or receding down it becomes shallow that means both the fornices are shallow so mild grade 2 can be discovered by this maneuver where you push the lower fornix into its normal position and observe what happens to the upper fornix in this situation obviously you have to form both the fornix fornices if you form only the lower fornix here then the patient will not have a appropriate cosmosis because upper fornix will continue to remain shallow grade 3 is when there is grade 2 plus shallowing of the medial and the lateral fornices which is indicated by horizontal shortening if you measure horizontal palpable fissure of the right eye and compare with the left eye if there is disparity that means that there is shallow medial and the lateral fornix unless of course there is lateral canthal dehiscence or disinsertion so you should exclude rounding of the lateral canthal angle if it is normal and sharp then you measure it if there is disparity of more than 2 mm then you consider that there is shallow medial and lateral fornices grade 4 is grade 3 plus reduction in palpable fissure which essentially means the same there is reduction in both horizontal and vertical palpable fissure which is a much severe form of contraction which means that there is generalized contraction of the ocular surface along with loss of volume grade 5 is refractory contracted socket where there is keratinization of the socket as you see here this is generally following external beam radiation or multiple prior surgeries this is grade 0 to grade 5 there are six grades now for the classification for the purpose of management is as follows surface loss where the surface of the socket is short volume loss where there is volume is short and combined surface plus volume loss surface loss is present when the volume is adequate yet there is fornicial contraction that means that you have put a 20 mm implant or a 18 mm implant yet you cannot insert a custom or a ocular prosthesis at all that is surface loss volume loss is when you have never put an implant there is no primary implant or the implant is of a smaller size than what is required that is volume loss or congenital no combined surface plus volume loss is when both the mechanisms coexist together because based on this the man further management follows now when you have this you also classify the socket as wet and dry because wet sockets can be surgically manipulated whereas dry sockets are very difficult to surgically manipulate so that is also a consideration so when you diagnose a case of contracted socket your diagnosis should be like you know it should be entire it should state whether it is congenital or acquired ophthalmic or an ophthalmic contracted socket with soft tissue and or bony contracture right with surface loss or volume loss wet or dry so all these factors should be mentioned very clearly in the file because the decision tree is based on exactly this based on all these factors management is prosthetic surgical and combined essentially you have to use this in a majority of patients where you would do surgery and you would also change the prosthesis so it's a combined management but there are specific indications for prosthetic management
this is uh, what we use is a very simple straightforward uh, decision making table where if there is shallow phonics and there is no surface loss at all you have determined that there is no surface loss phonics is shallow but surface is adequate and there is no volume loss then you simply refit the prosthesis if the patient is already using a stock eye you make it a custom ocular prosthesis and it will stay so that is prosthetic management if that is not possible if the surface is adequate volume is adequate prosthesis is getting displaced upwards and the lower phonics is shallow you simply have to do a phonics formation suture that is very straightforward shallow phonics no surface loss no volume loss refit the prosthesis and if that is not happening then you do phonics formation suture if there is shallow phonics and the surface loss is mild there is no volume loss then you do phonics formation with relaxing incision so how do you determine that the first step in phonics formation is to assess the adequacy of the superior phonics when you reform the inferior phonics in most of the situations you reform the inferior phonics you don't reform the superior phonics right so on the table you mark the medial canthus you mark the lateral canthus two dots and then the line that joins the medial canthus to the lateral canthus that's your reference point and then you measure 12 mm from the lower lid margin right mark a dot there that is the depth of your inferior phonics then hold a blunt instrument such as lens spatula and push the dot that you have marked as the depth of the inferior phonics towards the inferior orbital margin in that process observe what is happening to the central mark that you have created between the medial canthus and the lateral canthus if that starts moving down then there is a definite need for a relaxing incision most of the situation that happens when you move the depth of the inferior phonics move towards the depth of the inferior phonics the central mark starts moving down that means that there is volume is oh, sorry there is surface deficit so you have to give a relaxing incision why do you need to give a relaxing incision because your i would say transfer of conjunctiva towards the inferior phonics should not affect the depth of the superior phonics by doing a relaxing incision you are essentially disconnecting the superior phonics from the inferior phonics so the inferior phonics now can be independently deepened without shallowing the superior phonics that's why you give this horizontal relaxing incision now when you form the lower phonics if the gap between the horizontal relaxing incision the upper edge and the lower edge is 4 mm of less you leave it to granulate you don't have to do any graft but if that gap is about 4 to 8 mm then that area is quite large for a granulation repair so you have to ideally use an amniotic membrane so that the repair is faster reepithelialization is faster and is less granulation tissue and less scarring now if the gap gap between the two edges is more than 8 mm then ideally you use a mucus membrane graft is that quite clear the first thing is to mark uh, i don't have yeah so i'll draw it here and show medial canthus lateral canthus and the center you have marked the center now that's the lower lid margin right okay now you mark 12 mm of this so there will be palpable conjunctiva and the bulba conjunctiva basically and somewhere is the phonics you mark 12 mm that is the depth of the lower phonics you move this mark towards the inferior orbital margin using a blunt spatula so when you start moving it if this starts moving down that means that there is surface loss so now you have to disconnect the upper phonics from the lower phonics by doing a horizontal relaxing incision now once you do this horizontal relaxing incision there is disconnection between the upper part of the conjunctiva and the lower part of the conjunctiva now you undermine this and create a flap and easily form your phonics three sutures the medial one does not pass through the periosteum the lateral and the central pass through the periosteum you form the phonics now the gap between this upper edge and the lower edge is assessed if it is 4 mm of less then you can leave it to granulate if it's 4 to 8 mm you fill in an amniotic membrane simply glue on an amniotic membrane in that area 
If it's eight millimeter or more, then ideal would be a mucous membrane graft. But if you haven't prepared the patient for it, you can still use an amniotic membrane. But what is mandatory is a is a conformer and a suture tarsography. We we'll, I'll show you a video of that later. So mild contracted socket, you refit the prosthesis, or you can also use what is called socket expanders. Socket expanders are nothing but regular conformers which are gradually increased in size. Patient has come to you today and you're able to fit a 22 millimeter conformer on top of which you're able to do a tarsography. By three to four weeks, the 22 millimeter conformer that you have put would become loose in the socket. That means that the socket is expanded now. Now you can go for a 24 millimeter and consequently after about three more weeks to a 26 millimeter conformer, when the 26 millimeter conformer fits snugly and it is well centered, how do you know a conformer is well centered? Its central conduit, central hole should be in the line joining the medial canthus and the lateral canthus. So if it's a well centered 26 millimeter conformer, the patient is ready to get a new prosthesis fitted. This is the patient where refitting was performed and she has a stable prosthesis. Now, these are the serial conformers that are supposed to be used, starting with the conformer, which is snugly fitting. And when you fit it, there should be about two to three millimeter gap between the upper lid and the lower lid. So it should be a little tighter than what is otherwise fitted. And then you do a force tarsography on top of that using 4-0 proline suture with a central suture. You really don't have to use three sutures. Leave it in position for about three to four weeks. Then call the patient back. Before you remove the suture, test the mobility of the conformer within the socket. If it is loose, then you remove the suture, right? And then put a larger conformer and repeat the process. This is a patient where this was the conformer that went in early in the first occasion. This is the second occasion. In the third occasion, a nice large conformer went in and she could be fitted with a prosthesis. When she came in, she had no prosthesis and there was no way prosthesis could be fitted. So obviously the socket is a great scope for expansion and use it. You, sh you should use it to your advantage. Now those are serial conformers. There are also called pressure expanders. Pressure expanders work by creating an anteroposterior pressure over the conjunctiva, right? So, what does the ocularis do? He makes a conformer which is customized or molded to the size of the socket plus two millimeter. So you have taken a measurement, you get this kind of a shape, you add about two millimeter on either side and you make a larger custom conformer. You make a stem and this is the base of the stem. So it is like a wine glass like that much shallower, right? So this is the conformer that goes towards the socket. This is a stem that comes out to the palpable fissure. And this base of the stem is there for the patient to place sticking tapes and apply it from the forehead to the cheek. So it is our patient can be using a finger, give digital pressure as well several times a day. This is to create anteroposterior pressure on the socket. These sockets are supposed to expand slightly more rapidly as compared to a regular serial conformers. Now there is something called molded socket stimulators. Why do you need molded socket stimulators? Because the socket shape is not always as regular as to accommodate a regular size conformer. It may be very irregular, traumatized socket, multiple prior surgeries. Such situation you have to mold a socket stimulator. Again, the same principle, mold it to the socket size, add two millimeter, make it larger, place it and do a suture tarsography. Sometimes there is canthal shortening, especially in congenital situations. There you use a canthal expander. Now, this is a patient where there is contracted socket. Looking at her, him initially, you will feel that, oh, my, I must do surgery in this patient. But this patient did not need surgery at all. This is a pressure conformer that our ocularist has designed. This is how it is taped. There is no tarsorophy that is done. And you can see over a period of 16 weeks, that's four months, which you may feel that, oh, it's such a long time, but that's great. But you can see the size of the prosthesis is nearly normal. He did not need any surgery at all. He needed two or three visits because every time he came, we had to change the size of the conformer to make it larger and larger. These are molded socket stimulators, which are again custom made. These are for babies, for congenital and ophthalmic socket. 
Now, this is a child who underwent this procedure. You can see lower for initial shallowing, shallow uh, upper phonics as well, horizontal shortening, shelving of the lower phonics, very small palpable fissure. And there is a microphthalmic eye, which had very minimal sensation. So we could easily place a conformer on top of it, which was molded to the socket. And over a period of time, without having to do enucleation, we were able to place a custom ocular prosthesis. Parents were against enucleation, otherwise that would have been a reasonable option. Now, this is a child where there is a horizontal shortening of the palpable fissure. Now, that needs to be expanded. Otherwise, these patients cannot surgically be managed easily. You can never cut the lateral canthal angle and expect the prosthesis to be retained. At any cost, at all cost, in fact, you have to retain the lateral canthal angle. Prosthesis slides out easily if the lateral canthal angle is damaged. So how do you achieve expansion without cutting the lateral canthal angle? You have to use this canthal expanders. These are static canthal expanders. So what the ocularist has done is he has created this uh, custom conformer, which is bizarre in shape because it has to mold to the socket that is available. We can't make it to our uh, you know, imagined shape and size because it has to mold to the socket. And these are uh, steel wires that are coming out thick ones on top of that silicon has been used and this can be bent to the uh, shape that is required and that will expand the canthus over a period of time. This is spring-loaded canthal expander which can also be made by the ocularist for horizontal expansion. So canthal expansion is possible by oculariste techniques. Now, if nothing else is possible, if you still find that the process is small and if you cannot do surgery, then you can use cosmetic optics, use a higher power plus lens, sometimes even cylindrical lens to make sure that from for the person who looks at the patient, it looks nearly normal. It's an optical illusion that you're creating by using cosmetic optics. Now, if nothing else is possible, of course, you can use orbital prosthesis. Now, going on to surgical options, those were the prosthetic options. Now, going on to surgical options, we have orbital expansion, phonics formation suture, amniotic membrane graft, MMG, dermispite graft, and secondary orbital implant. This is a technique of hydrogel socket expander. This was in fashion about 10 years ago. We did a small fellow project. It did not work well for us, so we stopped doing it. So what... Uh, they provide is a hydrogel button. Unfortunately, they are very averse to making hydrogel in the shape of the socket. They provide you a round button, which will create a bird-like socket. You know, it's like a round socket, which is not really nice because you see the socket has expanded, no doubt, but it is round. It does not have that nice angle, right? So you need to implant this hydrogel buttons in the socket and hang them to the upper phonics and lower phonics with sutures and over a period of time the moisture in the socket is absorbed by hydrogel and hydrogel will start expanding very gradually why you should do it is because when you it is a theory that when you put push in a conformer which is large in size into a gentle child socket there is something called socket burn that means that you are inducing so much of damage to the conjunctiva and inflammation that the socket will contract the moment you remove the conformer. That we always see. Unless you augment this process with 5FU, then when you force fit a conformer and do a suture tarsography, the moment you remove the conformer or if the child loses the conformer, within three or four days, the socket shrinks back again. Because the inducement for fibrosis is never taken care of. But by gently expanding the socket, the burnt socket syndrome can be avoided. That is the theory behind it. But this has to be a very gradual process. It is expensive. You can see this is the kind of button they provide. This is the kind of hangback sutures that we use. And you see how round these are. And over a period of time, this expands to this size. That's real life picture where we implanted this. And when we removed it, it had expanded to this size. So it is nice, but it is a round thing. And we also have a similar implant for the orbit. This also we did as a fellow project and abandoned because it did not produce good results. Here, the principle is that you cannot do make any incision in the conjunctiva. So if you make incision in the conjunctiva in a contracted socket in a child, that will cause more contraction. So here, what we do is lateral to the lateral canthus, we create a skin incision 
go into the intraconal space and inject this small implant. So we use a 1 cc syringe with the hub of the syringe cut, go right into the intraconal space and inject the small implant. And over a period of time, it becomes this big. Right? So what it does is it very slowly expands the orbit over a period of two or three months or even four months. And once that is done, this being hydrogel, it can be left alone or it can be removed and a secondary implant can be placed in that position. So that is the theory of socket expansion using hydrogel spheres. Now there are also hydrogel rods like this, small rods, two or three millimeter rods like this, which can simply be injected into the socket. They grow in size, then by volume expansion, they expand the orbital board. But these are currently not so much used. But what protocol we have for children with congenital severe contracted socket with no visual potential is that first step, in the first step, we normalize the palpable fissure. Our goal is to make the palpable fissure at least within two millimeter of the contralateral side, horizontally, and also vertical lid height. Vertical lid height should be at least two millimeter less than the normal size. If the normal vertical lid height is about 16 millimeter in a two-year-old child, we want it at least 14 millimeter. Until that happens, we keep on expanding the socket by using serial conformers. So once the horizontal palpable fissure normalizes, and the lid, vertical lid height normalizes, then we do enucleation and then a primary orbital implant and then fit a custom ocular prosthesis. Because the lid and the conjunctiva are already expanded, you can definitely use a larger implant during enucleation, otherwise which you cannot use. And you already have an expanded lid for you to support the prosthesis. So this is the result that we got in this child who still comes for follow-up. There are many situations, many cases like this, where we have used this particular process for, to provide optimal cosmosis. This is one such child, the children have to come to you at a young age. If they come at seven or eight years of age, then this process will not work. They have to come to you at about one, maximum two years of age. Again, this child was also expanded over a period of time. You can see that there's hardly any difference between the right and the left custom ocular prosthesis because the lid is fully expanded. It is possible to expand the lid to a certain extent after enucleation by using a larger conformer and a prolonged tarsorophy that we do. That we do only if the disparity is about two to three millimeter between the right eye and the left eye in terms of horizontal palpable fissure and the vertical lid height. But if it is more as gross as this, then you would obviously want to expand the lids first and then do the rest of it. Now, rest of the surgical management, phonics formation, I already mentioned how to do a horizontal relaxing incision and how to form the phonix. I'll skip these slides, but of course, six sutures are used if you're doing both the upper and the lower. Most important sutures are the central sutures. They must pass through the periosteum. Medial sutures need not or should not pass through the periosteum. Lateral sutures, supratemporal especially, you should be careful not to pass it through the lacrimal gland. These are the precautions that we use for phonix formation suture and also suture tarsorophy is mandatory. Never tie the suture before you place the conformer. Once you tie the suture, it is impossible to place the conformer. That is one more precaution that you must take. And suture tarsorophy should not be removed for at least three weeks. So this was a patient who came with an inflamed socket, shallow lower phonics, where all we did was initial topical steroid therapy followed by lower phonics formation and she could retain a prosthetic eye. Let me see. Yeah. Right. So now this is a video of mucus membrane graft. As, as I mentioned, if the gap between the conjunctiva upper edge and the lower edge is more than 8 millimeter, you should ideally use a mucus membrane graft. So this is a patient where there is severe contracted socket. You can see there is very less conjunctiva that is left. And this patient has undergone some procedure in the past. We are not sure what procedure. There are no medical records available. This is how we mark the center of the palpable fissure and allot adequate amount of conjunctiva to the lower phonics. Horizontal incision, but not violating the lateral mm -hmm. and the medial canthus. To create two flaps. In the process of creating the flap, I discovered that there was a shriveled sclera inside. So possibly has undergone evisceration earlier, which we are not sure. 
imaging did not show anything much except some fibrous tissue, but actually has undergone evisceration. So we could even find the extraocular muscles attached to that shriveled sclera. So this eviscerated sclera was excised. If I'd known it before surgery, I would have even planned for a dummy fat graft. It was a nice situation where DFG could have been placed. But uh, nevertheless, that was a shriveled sclera that we found, which we eviscerated. Now we are going ahead with creating the lower flap by creating subconjunctival dissection. It should not be too close to the conjunctiva. You can use fibrous tissue as a scaffold to create a thick flap. Phonix formation is performed using 4-0 silk, sutures tied over silicon bolsters. Similarly, upper phonics is also formed. The size is measured. Lower lip is marked. That's the vermilion line where that's your anterior extent beyond which you won't go sutures through the edge of the lower lip. Posteriorly, you won't go beyond the frenulum. Then the adequate size mucosa is marked. His mucosa is very dull and lusterless because he was a tobacco chewer. So there will be submucosal fibrosis in this situation. So you should expect that. Submucosal xylocaine to blanch the mucus, mucosa. Then the peri periphery of the mucosa is incised using a monopolar RF electrode. You can definitely use a Bart Parker knife with little more bleeding, but this is good. Can be done under local or general anesthesia. If you do general anesthesia, then there should be nasal intubation, submucosal dissection. Preserving all the glands in the lip, excise the mucosa, cauterize bleeding points and thrombin powder. By the time you finish suturing, this would have completely achieved hemostasis. Thin out the mucosa as much as possible. Place it in the socket and suture. Only tip during suturing is that it should be nice and large mucosa. It should be corrugated like this because when you fit in the conformer, it should expand under the conformer. If you achieve a tight closure of the mucosa, there's no scope for the mucosa to expand when you put in a 26 millimeter conformer. So it should be very, very lazily sutured. And when you fit in the conformer, you can see that under the conformer, mucosa actually expands. So tasserophy is important. He had some skin scarring also that was released. Phonic sutures are tied after the suture tasserophy is tied. And the socket is dressed. And now about the donor site, you can leave it to granulate, but that's a very painful process. Ideally, you should use an amniotic membrane, which is glued onto the mucosal raw surface so that the patient is comfortable and can eat semi-solids and solids within three or five days following surgery. Same patient following fitting of the prosthesis, reasonably good results. Now, next surgery, I think is, yeah, so let's skip this. Yeah, so this is one example where there is a severe cicatrization of the socket. Again, mucous membrane graft was performed and following which the patient is able to retain a adequately sized socket. Now, this is a very severe situation where there is almost an ankylobrephron where still you can use mucous membrane graft, but you need a large mucous membrane graft. You can line the socket nicely like this. This I uh, was planning as a two-step procedure. You cannot do dermis fat graft in a situation where there is ankylobrephron. So my first choice was a mucous membrane graft. When we could line the mucosa very nicely like this, my idea was to split the mucosa in the middle and put a DFG for volume replacement. The patient did not want a hip scar. She wanted to get married sooner. So she, the moment she could be fitted with a prosthesis, she said, I don't want any further surgery. And she was okay with it. So, But then it is suboptimal cosmosis. Yet she is able to retain a cosmosis. That's happy for her. But at the same time, we could still do more for her by doing a dermis fat graft on top of a MMG. So you can do a stage procedure. Now about dermis fat graft, we talked about all this already. Now, uh, dermis fat graft, whenever there is shallow phonics, surface loss, as well as volume loss, the only surgery that is possible is dermis fat graft. Then no other surgery is possible. 
This was described by Smith and Petrilli in 1971, very recently. So to say, autogenous graft volume and surface re replacement is concurrently provided. It preserves the existing conjunctiva, which is not damaged at all. Dermis protects against fat absorption. Dermis also provides you the surface. Dermis gets completely conjunctivalized. So it has a lot of advantages. It's a living graft. It becomes larger when the patient gains weight. It loses volume when the patient loses weight. So it's a very nice living graft which lives forever. And it expands this orbit, especially in a child undergoing enucleation for a microphthalmic eye. This is recommended. It can be used as a primary graft. It can be used as a secondary graft. More often than not, it is used as a secondary graft. It can also be used to cover an exposed say, a uh, porous polyethylene or a hydroxyapatite implant. What happens when you fit in a dermis graft is that over a period of time, the dermis get completely conjunctival. As you will not see dermis, it, you'll see pink conjunctiva all over it. Fat gets vascularized and it gets completely integrated with the orbital soft tissue without any plane of cleavage between. We talked about it, gross with the child, living graft and long-term stability is guaranteed. Provided it takes, means that there is an initial phase where there could be fat absorption, there could be scarring of the fat, but once it becomes stable, it takes about three to four months for the dermis fat graft to become stable. Once it becomes stable, it is stable for long. So this is a video, quickly I'll show you this video to show the process of dermis fat graft. That's the patient where there is volume as well as surface deficit. Again, marking the lower fornix 12 millimeter from the lower mar lid margin, horizontal relaxing incision starting from that mark. You can see you let very little tissue for the upper fornix. Of course, dermis will come and fill that gap. Our priority is lower fornix, subconjunctival dissection, including scar tissue. So that you want a tectonically strong lower flap for the lower fornix. If you have only bare conjunctiva, then sutures may not stay properly. Superior flap is being freed up by dissecting it from the underlying scarred fat. Both the flaps are to be free. Then you fl split the scarred fat and orbital soft tissues to accommodate the dermis fat graft. Fornix formation sutures. Three for the upper phonics and three for the lower phonics. Using silicon bolsters, I've already described that. Through the periosteum, centrally and laterally, not through the periosteum, medially. Then when you've done all this, you measure the size of the dermis fat graft, horizontally as well as vertically. Add about 30% to it. Mark the junction of anterior superior LX pan and the ischial tuberosity. In the midline, you mark this ellipsoid graft, relatively less hair bearing area. A bewelled incision only through the epidermis, not deeper than the epidermis. Highly bewelled incision. Similar bewelled incision through the epidermis inferiorly. Then you have to inject any fluid xylocaine is perfectly okay under the epidermis to create this beauty orange appearance. It has to be a tabletop elevation of the epidermis over the dermis. It's a difficult injection. There's no plane you're pushing to create a plane here. Then you use a carbonated blade or a dermabrader or a diamond dusted burr, whatever you wish or fancy. To remove the epidermis. The goal is to completely remove epidermis without leaving any residual epidermis because if it is there, then it lacked as a competitive inhibition for conjunctivalization. That pinpoint bleeding is the correct plane. Harvesting the dermis fat graft, initial incision is inferior. To do superiorly, then there may be blood trickling over the inferior aspect, obscuring your view. So always do the inferior first and the superior. Don't cut the angles first. Angles are always cut last. Harvest about 15 to 20 millimeter fat plug, then trim it to the size that you need. Do not ever overfill. There should be no mooning of the graft. When you place it, it should just remain static there. 
you should not moan out or sprout out. If you have the extraocular muscles, suture the extraocular muscles to the edges of the dermis. If you don't have, directly suture conjunctiva to the edge of the dermis fat graft. Very, very simple process. Use 60 vitrile for this. Because the hip wound also needs to be closed concurrently by a different surgeon or a surgeon assistant. 360 degree closure with gaps between each suture. Phonics with a conduit well centered. Suture tasserophy first, followed by tying of the phonics formation suture. Inferior 6 o'clock, 12 o'clock, then suprotemporal, infrotemporal. You, know, you should always tie opposite sutures. Don't tie all the three sutures of the inferior phonics and then try to tie the sutures of the superior phonics. Then you'll be shallowing the superior phonics. Try alternate sutures and that's how it looks at the end of surgery and that's how it looks after about three months when we fit a prosthetic eye. Yeah, this is a child with dermis fat graft. You can see preoperatively the child was not able to retain even a painted conformer following surgery. The child is able to retain a prosthetic eye. One more example of an adult with a dermis fat graft. It's a beautiful procedure. It works very well. It has very few complications. This is one more example of an adult. Complications are infection. This is an early complication and that is possible. If you are very, I mean, if there is a hematoma that can get secondly infected or if you're not, remove the epidermis completely, then that can create false smelling discharge, which can get secondly infected. But if you remove the epidermis entirely, then there is very less chance of false smelling discharge or discharge or infection. Atrophy happens in about 15 to 20% of patients, but it is not complete atrophy. Even if it's a failed dermis graft, fat graft, it is better than a socket that you began with. You can still fit a prosthetic eye. Failed dermis fat graft only means that it is not to your satisfaction, but that does not mean that you cannot fit a prosthetic eye. Hypertrophy does happen when the patient gains weight. There are situations when you have to go back and debulk the dermis fat graft. I have done it twice in my uh, surgical lifetime. So I had to debulk the graft because the prosthesis was popping out, the graft has become, had become much bigger. So tips are that we should measure accurately 30% oversize when you harvest it. The moment you excise the dermis fat graft from its location, it contracts and becomes smaller. So that 30% uh, excess is not to oversize the graft, but to adequately size the graft. Avoid overfilling that is indicated by mooning of the graft when you fit it in the socket. It should not moon out. It should lie, lie stably. And finally, contour the implant to suit the defect. So it has to be a custom prosthesis. This is one more complication where there is a hair that is sprouting out through the conduit. It can only be electrolyzed. Obviously, there will be hair. It, no surface of the body is completely non-hair bearing, especially in our race, so there will be some hair somewhere and that can sprout like this or there could be diffuse hair growth in the socket that also needs to be electrolyzed. There would be few occasions, especially if the patient has undergone prior multiple surgeries or trauma or radiation, there could be delayed epithelization. So you should never fit a prosthesis until the dermis becomes pink. So this after six weeks, you can see that there is still a white surface. At this stage, if you fit a prosthetic eye, then they could be further contracture or infection. You want to inspect this and you should have these conduits to drain discharge and fluid that accumulates. There should be no source for infection. And finally, when the conjunctiva becomes complete or the graft becomes completely conjunctivalized, then only you should fit a prosthesis. So delayed epithelization or delayed conjunctivalization is a complication in which you can use... Um, you know, serum drops or uh, obviously use platelet rich uh, plasma. So, those are some of the newer indications that have happened, or you can even cover it with an amniotic membrane. There are many uh, measures that you can take in such situations, but this is again quite rare. But what have you, if you have done a dermis fat graft and uh, then it becomes uh, atrophic, then you can do fat injection. So you can harvest fat by liposuction and inject it. I think I lost. Yeah, this is a patient where dermis fat graft has been done, but you can see that she had undergone prior radiation, so it has contracted. So following fat injection, its anterior posterior location is kind of got nearly normalized. So this is a pre, and you can see post. It's come 
forward. So this is something that you can do in atrophic grafts. So in conclusion, I would uh, say that dummy fat graft is a very useful technique for replacement of volume as well as surface. This is the, again, I'm putting the same slide again for you to simply revise what I already mentioned, surface loss, sorry, shallow phonics, no surface loss, no volume loss, prosthetic management or phonics formation suture. If there is mild surface loss, just a relaxing incision and form the phonics. If there is moderate surface loss, that means there's more than four millimeter gap between the upper and the lower edge of the conjunctiva after giving relaxing incision, amniotic membrane with FFS. If there is more than eight millimeter, then you would prefer to do mucous membrane grafting. If there is no implant at all, surface is fine, volume is lost, then you can use a secondary implant for sure. If both surface and volume are lost, then the best option is dermis fat graft. And if nothing is possible, then an orbital prosthesis. So in conclusion, management of contracted socket is challenging, but you should actually take time to assess the contracted socket. Is there any surface loss? Is there any volume loss? Is there both? Is there only soft tissue contraction? Is there bony contraction or both? Is the socket dry or uh, wet? Or is there any horizontal palpable fissure contraction? Is there any vertical lid height contraction? And put it all together to individualize care. In certain situations, you would need prosthetic management before surgical management. In certain situations, you need prosthetic management after surgical management. So you have to prioritize what is required at what stage and uh, customize care for a given patient. Generally, you get good uh, results when, in the management of contracted surgery. Thank you so much. I think we are over short time, but still, if you have any burning questions, I'm happy to take. Thank you so much, sir, for such an extensive, wonderful presentation. Uh, so one of the questions uh, uh, which is there is in a case of atrophic or thysis bulbi mm -hmm. with a con uh, with a contracted socket, uh, is it better to perform enucleation and then go with the uh, rest of the steps uh, over the existing eye, or uh, what are the factors which should be considered while putting a COP over a microphthalmic or atrophic? Um, bulbi? Yeah. Whenever you put COP or a custom ocular prosthesis or any prosthesis over on top of an atrophic or a thysic ally, you should assess the comfort of the patient. So when you send this, such a patient to an ocularist, what they do is they do a trial fit. They fit a conformer. First, of course, you, in the clinic, you should assess corneal sensation and sensation of the ocular surface. If the patient has normal or near normal corneal sensation or sensation of the ocular surface, then such a patient is not a good candidate for a prosthesis on top of a existing eye but nevertheless if the patient is non not keen on surgery then they should undergo a prosthesis trial where the ocularist will fit a dummy prosthesis and make the patient wait for about four to six hours and if the patient is comfortable at the end of this trial period you can go for a custom ocular prosthesis there again if the patient is highly sensitive or moderately sensitive they don't flush fit the custom ocular prosthesis initially they give a vault between the anterior surface of the cornea and the custom ocular prosthesis. That increases the risk of infection, but that makes the patient comfortable. That is the modification that you can do by giving a vault so that the posterior surface of the prosthesis does not rub against the cornea directly. These patients may not be able to use the prosthesis for 24 by 7. They may have to remove it at the end of the day and reinsert the next morning. That will also cause mechanical trauma, and uh, the fact that the patient is without a prosthesis for 12, 18 hours a day would also mean there is some psychological issues that are associated with it. If a patient wants comfortable prosthesis 24 by 7, then the best option is to do surgery and fit a prosthesis. So the next uh, question is, uh, in case of exposed implants, what is the best option? Is it better to... Uh just cover it with a sub uh, one of the options you gave or in, especially if they are a smaller implant which is leading to uh, contact with okay. No, if you bury implants um, recklessly on a Friday, it will rise on a Sunday. So you should never bury, <laughs> bury an implant, you know, with a cover unless you have understood the mechanism. So if it's an early exposure, suppose you have done surgery last week and you find that the central... Uh, part of the implant is exposed and you find evidence of infection and it's a small exposure right so when you treat infection 
undermine conjunctiva tenens, get hold of large, nice, juicy bites of tenens, suture that first with a buried knot. You understand what I mean by a buried knot. The knot should not come towards the conjunctiva, it should go towards the implant. All right? In two layers. You suture the tenens and suture the conjunctiva. That is if there is about three to four millimeter gain in the presence of infection. If there is no infection, you can always interpose a disc of sclera. If you have donor sclera available, create about six or eight millimeter disc of donor sclera, put it in between the implant and the anterior tenens, suture the anterior tenens to the donor sclera as much as it can cover it, and then suture the conjunctive. That is the second way of doing it. Suppose the exposure is little larger, say 8 millimeter, 9 millimeter, but there is no infection. Then you can do what is called a relaxing incision. Go just short of the superior fornix, just short of the inferior fornix. Give a large, about 10, 12 millimeter relaxing incision, curvilinear, parallel to the fornix, each fornix in the conjunctiva. That will mobilize the conjunctiva for you to get a primary closure, closing the implant. And the conjunctival defect in the superior and inferior phonics can be relayed with amniotic membrane. Always you will have to use a conformer at the end of the procedure. That is provided there is no infection. Suppose there is infection, you can't do much about it initially. You will have to take care of the infection first. But topical and systemic antibiotics, take a culture if you wish. Make sure that the patient gets the correct antibiotic. Resolve the infection, there is no hurry. Then you can. While doing that, conformer is mandatory. If you lose the conformer, then you lost the game. Right? Conformer is definitely has definitely has to be there. Now, there are situations where in the first week itself or in the first three or four weeks, the entire wound breaks down for whatever reason. It could be a irradiated socket. More often than not, it happens in an irradiated socket. Or there is secondary hematoma in the socket which creates pressure or if the child has mechanical trauma or severe infection, whatever may be the reason, there are patients who come to you very rarely with the implant in their hand, so to say. You know, the implant would have extruded. Now, what do you do in such situations? You can't put the implant back because the socket would have contracted. So there, I salvage the situation by putting a large conformer, doing a suture tarsorophy, let the socket heal. Over six weeks, believe me, there is a very nice conjunctivalization of the entire socket. Of course, it will be concave, not convex as you want it to be. But the conformer is there which would have secured your furnaces. First thing is to secure the furnaces. Lock the main door. That is the conformer. So you have to have conformer in there. Now, once the conjunctiva is healed with the furnaces well secured, you can always do a secondary implant or a dermis fat trap. That is the third way. This is all this in early exposures. But suppose it's a delayed exposure. If it's a PMMA implant or a silicone implant, small implant, again, the same process, undermine the conjunctiva, get hold of the tenons. Most important is to put your needle in like that and then, you know, hook the tenons and somehow get hold of the tenons, large bites of tenons and suture it. And then conjunctiva, small gape. If it's larger gape, use a scleral interface. And if it is much larger, then see what is the reason for such an exposure. Sometimes the implant may be larger than what is required. So you'll have to do an implant exchange. If the implant is of normal size, yet there is an exposure, then you can do conjunctival flap, just like the Hughes flap. You know, you can take tarso conjunctival graft from the upper lid. If that is not adequate, you can also harvest tarso conjunctival graft from the lower eyelid cover the defect. This is a vascularized flap. This will heal better after scleral interposition for a larger defect in the conjunctiva exposing a non-integrated implant. But it, if it is an integrated implant and that is exposed and a larger area is exposed, then I would burr the implant till it starts bleeding. I would do first a contrast enhanced MRI, see if the implant is vascularized at all. If the implant is not at all vascularized, then nothing will work. You have to remove that implant and place a different implant. If the implant is vascularized or contrast is enhancing up to, say, two-thirds or three-fourths of the extent of the implant, anterior surface, generally it is the anterior surface which is not vascularized. The posterior part of the implant gets nicely vascularized because it's, it has egress to fat and vasculature. So anteriorly, you start drilling it till it starts bleeding. The implant actually bleeds because you re have reached the area where it is vascularized. There is fibrovascular growth. Once it starts bleeding, 
nicely smooth on the surface, take a thin dermis fat graft and place it on top and suture the conjunctiva around it. That's how you salvage a you know, uh, integrable or integrated implant, which is exposed. That's it. There are, of course, more ingenious ways of doing it, but this is, I mean, sums up most of what we do. Thank you, sir. Um, most of the other questions have been covered by you. Prithika, uh, any comments? Uh, Expert comments. You're muted and you're nodding. Nothing else to add. Everything's been covered. Sir, I have a question, sir. Yeah. Sir, in a case of a contracted socket, which is being managed by DFG, and then you said that there is a hypertrophy in less than 5% of the cases, which have been managed uh, later by uh, debulking it. Is there a role of uh, uh, injecting steroids uh, into the fat because it can induce hypertrophy? Oh. Steroids can also make it bigger. I don't know. We are not, I not tried it. But 5-fluorouracil has been injected. I have heard people injecting bleomycin, anything that scleroses fat. Mm. But short of it, you can simply go make a small incision on one mm. pole of the graft, lift it and take off some fat and suture it back. That's I find it more. This doesn't happen. I, I said I have just done two in my lifetime as a surgeon. So if it were to be more frequent, I would have tried some new techniques. You can never have series in more than one year so. So, sir, I'll just make an announcement for the next uh, iFocus uh, session, which is uh, going to be held by Dr. Sabri Desai. She'll be speaking on orbital eccentration, the indications, types, surgical techniques, and rehabilitation. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for covering this thank topic you. so extensively. And hope to see you again soon.